Welcome to Linking Patients to WIC and Other Food Safety Net Programs, Perspectives from Healthcare. My name is Merlene Tucker, and I'll be running this Dialogue for Health web form alongside my colleague, Jeff Bornstein. Thank you to our partner for today's event, the Center for Health, Law, and Policy Innovation of Harvard Law School. Now, it is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of today's event, Rachel Landauer. Rachel is a clinical instructor at the Center for Health, Law, and Policy Innovation at Harvard Law School, and welcome, Rachel. Thank you, Marlene. Hi, everyone. Welcome, and thanks for joining us for this webinar. Um, as Marlene said, my name is Rachel Landauer, and I'm an attorney at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation at Harvard Law School. Our mission at the center is to advocate for legal, regulatory, and policy reforms in both health and food systems with a focus on the health, public health, and food needs of systemically marginalized individuals. So we are really excited to bring this conversation at the intersection of critical life-saving programs like Medicaid, the Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC, and SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program to Life. And we are grateful to the Kaiser Permanente Community Health Fund at East Bay Community Foundation for the opportunity to do so. Our panelists in their presentations and in the moderated discussion, we'll expand much more on why they do this work alongside strategies, the how to do it. But I wanna set the stage with some sense of why today's conversation matters, why it makes sense for healthcare to really invest time and resources into actively and effectively connecting patients caregivers and families with WIC, SNAP, and other government nutrition programs. Next slide, please. So as many of us know, we have a, a very serious food insecurity problem in this country. 2023 analyses from the USDA's Economic Research Service, for example, shows that 12.8% of US households were food insecure at some point during 2022. That is 17 million households. And 17.3% of households with children were affected. That's 6.4 million households. While I don't have the statistics up on the slide, we also know that some groups bear a disproportionate burden compared to others, including communities of color. Among other reasons, this is concerning and problematic because food insecurity is strongly linked with a whole host of health issues, such as diabetes, heart disease, and poor mental health. And research shows that food insecurity is associated with an increased likelihood of emergency department visits, inpatient admissions or hospitalizations, and healthcare expenditures. We could spend the whole hour really exploring this connection between food insecurity and health, but I imagine many on the call are no stranger to this ever-growing body of evidence. Next slide, please. For many of you, it's also not surprising to hear that the healthcare sector is increasingly active at this intersection of health, hunger, and nutrition. We have more screening for food insecurity and other health-related social needs happening in primary care and other healthcare settings. We have a growing number of health plans and healthcare organizations trying to respond to needs that they've identified through referrals to community-based organizations, the direct offering of responsive services and supports, and through funding for services and supports. In communities across the country, we're seeing infrastructure investments to really help clinical and social care organizations work together better. And healthcare is helping to develop the evidence base through, for example, participation in pilots and demonstrations. And all of this is happening using an evolving array of policy levers and through a broad range of stakeholders, including the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, Medicaid Agency and other state regulators, health systems, insurers, philanthropy, and social services organizations. 
Next slide, please. Notably, within current momentum for food as medicine, there's a really strong spotlight on healthcare's role facilitating access to interventions such as medically tailored meals and produce vouchers. Interventions in the topmost tiers of what we call the food as medicine pyramid up here on the screen. But what about those lower tiers of interventions? Specifically today, access and participation in government nutrition assistance programs. It's really critical and exciting to be here with these great organizations talking about how, as we're advancing the integration of other kinds of food and nutrition interventions, we're also leveraging government benefit programs. Among other reasons, doing so means that we're able to reach more people. Not everyone has access to or is eligible for other types of interventions. We're able to offer an off-ramp or longer term resources at the end of shorter term interventions. And we're closer to maximizing available resources to address social determinants of health and positively impact health outcomes. Next slide. My last bit of level setting before I introduce and hand things off to our panelists, I just wanted for the other side of the equation in our audience to share a little bit about which food and nutrition assistance programs we're thinking about today. The U.S. Department of Agriculture's Food and Nutrition Service administers 16 domestic food and nutrition assistance programs. Two of the largest programs and ones that our speakers today really focus in on are SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. This is a monthly benefit available to individuals who meet financial and other non-financial eligibility criteria. And in an average month of fiscal year 2022, SNAP provided benefits to 41.2 million people. And the average benefit was about $230 per person per month. The Special Supplemental Nutrition Program for Women, Infants, and Children, or WIC, really supports the distribution of supplemental foods, healthcare referrals, and nutrition education for low-income, pregnant breastfeeding, and non-breastfeeding postpartum people, infants in low-income families, and children younger than five in low-income families who are found to be at nutritional risk. And in fiscal year 2022, WIC served about 6.3 million participants per month, with an average monthly food cost for food of about $48 per person. Next slide, please. Turning then to today's panel, I am so honored to be here with these three healthcare organizations leading tremendous work to link patients with programs like WIC and SNAP. We have Pamela Baker, a grants director at Healthcare Network, a Florida FQHC, federally qualified health center, and recipient of a WIC child grant, which we'll hear lots more about. We have Ambi Bohannon Jones, senior consultant of the National Social Health Practice, and Elizabeth Engberg, national lead of social health member outreach campaigns from Kaiser Permanente. Kaiser Permanente is a leading healthcare provider and not-for-profit health plan operating in a number of states across the country. And we have Grace Accor, Flexible Services Program Program Manager, and Annie Pham, the Director of Social Health, a Community Care Cooperative, or C3, a federally qualified health center-led accountable care organization um, here in Massachusetts really focused on advancing integrated and coordinated community-based care for Medicaid beneficiaries. We'll also have some support from additional team members who will help to answer question and answer uh, Q&A. And I'll ask them to introduce themselves in the chat now as I turn things over first to Pamela, then to Ambi and Elizabeth, and then to Grace and Annie to tell us more about their organizations and organizational activities to promote patient engagement in Food Safety Net programs. Thanks, Pamela. Good afternoon, everyone. Just waiting for slides. Next slide. There you go. Thank you. And next slide. Beginning in 1977, as a health care center specifically for migrant farm workers, Healthcare Network has been providing quality primary care services in Collier County, 
located in Southwest Florida, to men, women, and children of all ages, regardless of their income status or insurance coverage. We're the only federally, federally qualified health center in the county, which is saying a lot. It's a 2,000 square mile county, which is larger than the states of Rhode Island and Delaware. Um, today, Healthcare Network sees over 50,000 patients per year in 11 clinics and three mobile clinics and over 55% of the county's pediatric population. We provide a multitude of services such as dental, integrated behavioral health, specialty behavioral health, pharmacy, pediatrics, specialty services such as HIV, women's care, and senior care. Our community outreach team is comprised of one nurse, six community health workers, two of whom are also medical assistants, and we have currently three AmeriCorps members joining the team. The outreach team works collaboratively with private and public agencies, patients and their families to promote overall health and to provide the required support that's needed to address significant challenges in relationship to uh, social determinants of health. We connect individuals not only to the healthcare network services, but also to whatever public and private programs a person may need. Our community health workers are also known as promotoras de salud. They're trusted members of the community. They're from the culture and speak the language and are the liaisons when it comes to navigating both health and social services. These CHWs are also helpful as boots on the ground when it comes to getting a situational awareness of what's transpiring at the community level. Next slide. We are proudly one of the 36 sub-grantees for the WIC Community Inno Innovation and Outreach Project, also known as WIC Chow. The grant is aimed at increasing awareness, especially among underserved populations, about WIC benefits and services available. Our local program is in collaboration with the State Florida Department of Health for data collection and our local Department of Health in Collier County, who is the WIC provider here. Why did we get into this project? Multitude of reasons. Among the people that we serve, we found high rates of maternal morbidity and mortality. Uh, um, unprecedented really for a county such as ours. And also we had super high rates of childhood obesity. So we looked at the national rates, where the prevalence was right around 20%. Um, Collier County's rate was 36%, and among healthcare network pediatric patients, our childhood obesity prevalence was 43%. At the same time, surprisingly, we had only 55% of the eligible mothers in the county participating in the WIC program. So it seemed pretty obvious that we could make some strides towards at least those two data points with maternal morbidity and also um, childhood obesity. Uh, so as an FQHC, we're proud to be part of this critical initiative. So to look at new ways of connecting people to, to WIC and ultimately improving their health outcomes and the quality of their lives. The uh, WIC Chow initiative expands partnerships with community organizations and uses community level data to develop and test WIC outreach efforts with three interrelated goals. One is to increase awareness. The second is to increase the number of individuals enrolled and actively participating in which WIC. And the third is to identify tools, communication strategies, and outreach methods, which may be effective in increasing participation among eligible, but not using WIC. Um, to, to get started, our Collier Department of Health had a, held a overview tr and training of the WIC program for our community health workers, just to make sure we're all on the same page and we all understand the uh, eligibility and benefits. So they described eligibility, enrollment process, benefits packages, how to access benefits, and enrollment requirements for the WIC vendors. This training was of super great value to make sure that we're all on the same page. It gave, gave our community health workers insight into the process and then helped guide a series of focus groups so that we could capture the experience of WIC participants or potential, but not participating 
with participants. And then in turn, we train all our healthcare staff. What is WIC? What's it about? Who's eligible? So that we're not giving out incorrect information. We found that one of the biggest barriers was that um, potential WIC participants didn't understand they were eligible. There was a lot of misconception in the community um, and in among our staff as well. So we we have weekly huddles at our each of our 11 sites and we um, kind of randomly insert some information on WIC into those weekly huddles with all staff. Next slide. The WIC Child Project. Our, our community health workers engage and encourage grocery stores to apply and become an approved WIC vendor in the town of Immokalee. Immokalee is where we started out initially as a farm worker health center. It is high poverty, largely farm worker community with the majority Hispanic and Haitian population, around 16, 17,000 people. Um, and then for whom all, the population, very few speak English as their first language. And one of the ideas was to find specialty Caribbean and Spanish markets to be sure that culturally the foods that they were interested in were available and that that would not become a, bar a barrier. Um, we also, it's important to note that uh, even as though they, a lot of our folks don't speak English, they also, some aren't literate in any language. So it's important to, they thought, demonstrate how to use the WIC services. They clearly said handing them a, a brochure was not effective at all. They need demonstrations. So what we've been doing is in assisting enrollees using the wonderful WIC Shopper app. Um, it's a great app, but for people who are not used to using apps, not used to shopping, um, we'll actually go into the grocery store alongside the person and our, our CHWs demonstrate how to use their WIC app alongside them the first time. And that's been very successful so far. Um, we also, in order to address social determinants of health, we'll provide transportation vouchers so that anyone who's uh, a WIC participant can travel to the WIC vendors in an area with limited public transportation. I think that's it for now. Thank you. Next slide, please. And that brings us to Elizabeth and Abby. Hi, everyone. I'm so glad you're here um, to, to join in this conversation today. And I'm going to speak for, I'm going to aim at five minutes um, and represent both Ambie and I to ground uh, in the work that we're going to talk about today. And then so we can get to answering some questions. So um, Ambie Bohannon-Jones and I both work, and I'm Elizabeth Engberg, work for the Office of Community Health, the National Office of Community Health at Kaiser Permanente as part of the social health practice. And we've been engaged in this work um, specifically that we'll cover today for the past four years. Can we go to the next slide, please? So I'll start by just describing, I know there are many people on the call today, not all of whom may be familiar with Kaiser Permanente. So Kaiser Permanente is a nearly 80-year-old integrated nonprofit mission-driven health system. And as a system, Kaiser Permanente operates medical offices, labs, pharmacies, and other outpatient facilities, as well as 40 hospitals throughout our eight markets. Kaiser is both a health provider and a health plan, employing or exclusively contracting with physicians and other clinical staff, as well as those who administer the health plan. Also, as a nonprofit health system, we provide health services, mental and physical health services, to 12 and a half million members in those markets. And Kaiser Permanente invests at least 3% of operating revenue each year into the communities in which we operate to address the most pressing health needs for the members in those communities. What we're going to talk about today is the effort that we've been um, engaged in to elevate social health to the same level as mental and physical health in our health system and to build a sustainable structure to do that. Next slide, please. 
So the two things we're going to talk about today are the outreach campaigns we've been running for the past several years to members who we think will be eligible for either SNAP or WIC and connect those members to government food programs, those two specifically. There are similarities in how we've conducted these campaigns. Um, both were tested initially with a pilot. Both rely primarily in the initial outreach on text and email as the mode. And both facilitate a connection to that government program using the eligibility criteria that we know exists in SNAP or WIC and using what we know about our members to do that proactive outreach. But there's also some key differences that we've discovered in the past several years. SNAP is operated at a state level, administered at a state level with a single application site, usually in each state, whereas WIC is highly localized and that's really changed how we've approached each. There's some similar but different eligibility for each program. And so we even use different data within our system to identify members who we think would be eligible. And there are different application processes where WIC requires clinical data and SNAP does not. So let's go to the next slide and we'll take a look at some of those outcomes. So here's what we see as a result of those differences in administration and application needs. SNAP's been ongoing for four years. At this point, we've reached roughly two, two plus million households with nearly, with more than five million members in them. The engagement has varied by state and we've been able to ascertain um, as close as we can that we've had 125,000 members plus um, apply for, for SNAP. Um, we also use have used an interactive capability, a texting capability. And because of that interactive capability for SNAP, um, we've been able to see, to, to get those numbers of members who have applied. Uh, we know when they open the link, so we're actually testing member engagement and how messaging is working with them. Um, and then we do some follow-up to find out whether they applied. For WIC, it's on a much smaller scale. We've started by testing them with pilots, uh, but we also rely on um, working directly with localized partners and, and receiving some of the um, outcomes data from those partners. Um, both of them are purposely upstream from um, our medical offices to to uh, to not place the burden on clinicians. Um, and both of them have relied on some deep partnerships with um, with with organizations in the community. Um, um, and our method of outreach was also different with WIC as well. We chose to test an internal outreach uh, mode that didn't have the texting interactive capability. And so we haven't been able to test the engagement as closely as we have with SNAP. But again, some of that was really based on how the programs are administered. So those engagement numbers may look a little different as well. So I think with that, um, and I know you'll get this as follow up too. I'm gonna I'm gonna um, turn to the other panelists, and then we can get to answering some questions. Thanks, Rachel. Next slide, please. Off to you, Annie and Grace. Thanks, Rachel. Um, well, first, I'd like to thank Rachel and the team at the Center for Health Law and Policy Innovation for giving us this opportunity to share our work along with the great work that our co-panelists have shared. I'm Annie Pham, the Director of Social Health at Community Care Cooperative, or C3 for short. We are an accountable care organization founded and governed by federally qualified health centers. We're based in Massachusetts, and we work with community health centers in eight states. Um, Greece and I will talk a little bit about our approach to this work from the perspective of an accountable care organization, um, particularly our initiatives with our health centers in Massachusetts to support our Medicaid population. If we can go to the next slide, please. Our efforts um, to link uh, members to these food safety net programs is part of our overarching strategy for health-related social needs 
to provide holistic care to our members. So really thinking about addressing medical, behavioral health, and social needs. So there are really three buckets of work here, identifying health-related social needs, addressing unmet needs, and partnering for change. In thinking about identifying health-related social needs, we're asking questions like, how do we have conversations with members about food security? How do we build relationships with members such that they trust us enough to tell us that they need assistance with food? And then once we identify an unmet need, similar to what you've heard um, from our co-panelists, thinking about resource navigation. So when a member shares they're struggling to keep food on the table, we want to make sure that our health centers are ready to respond. So I'll talk a little bit more about how we are equipping frontline staff at our health centers to screen and respond to needs on the next slide. But last, um, in, this, in this final bucket, partnering for change. So we're thinking about how do we partner with other organizations in our community to advance this work? Next slide. So digging a bit deeper into screening and referral for food security specifically, we are required in our Medicaid contract in Massachusetts to screen members for health-related social needs. So we're screening members across domains, including food insecurity, housing stability, housing quality, employment, and transportation in primary care settings at 24 health centers in Massachusetts. For food security specifically, we're using the Hunger Vital Sign 2 question food insecurity screening tool to talk with members about whether they have concerns um, about having enough food. We implemented this screening in 2017 um, and very um, in line with what um, this, with some of the alarming statistics that Rachel shared at the beginning of the webinar about the impact of food security. We're seeing in our screening data that about 30% of members who have been screened are reporting food insecurity. So as an accountable care organization serving over 200,000 members in Massachusetts, we don't take it lightly that this means that over 60,000 of our members are struggling with food insecurity. So as these members are coming into our health centers and they're interacting with um, their care teams, we wanna assure that our frontline staff, particularly community health workers and patient advocates, are prepared to talk with members about their circumstances. As you've heard um, from other panelists in the work that they're doing at their respective organizations, the SNAP and WIC programs um, is very much so the first response. And we need to educate and train our staff on these programs so they feel confident talking with members about them. Um, an example of a community partnership we have is our work with Project Bread, an anti-hunger organization in Massachusetts. Project Bread has a variety of initiatives to address food security in Massachusetts, but one piece of their work is that they're also a SNAP outreach partner of DTA. So as the SNAP experts in the community, we've partnered with their organization to provide trainings to our frontline staff who are screening members for health-related social needs. Um, so similar to the trainings that you heard about at Healthcare Network, we cover concepts like what is the SNAP program? What is the WIC program? Who is eligible? How do you apply? And taking it a step further um, to address myths and challenges um, that we're hearing from the field on getting members connected to SNAP. And then additionally, I just also want to call out that we, um, in addition to providing um, the trainings on SNAP and WIC, we also um, are providing training on motivational interviewing and trauma-informed care to make sure we're taking a patient-centric approach and that staff are able to manage these conversations, which often can be sensitive in nature. Um, and then finally, uh, we could share resources, but we want to make sure our members apply and receive the benefits. So we have another initiative with Project Bread to test out a referral pathway where um, instead of giving members a phone number where they can call um, a SNAP counselor, we are making a referral to the hotline to have the counselor reach out to the member instead. So really reversing that process. Um, with this method, we are assuring that members are connecting with someone, um, which increases the likelihood that the member enrolls um, for these benefits. Next slide, please. And then for our most complex members, members who are experiencing food insecurity and have chronic conditions like diabetes or hypertension, or members who um, experience frequent hospitalizations or high ED utilization, where um, we've leveraged an opportunity through the Medicaid Section 1115 waiver in Massachusetts to provide nutrition supports to members. So really thinking at, um, at the top of the food is medicine pyramid here. For those of you not familiar with 
Section 1115 demonstrations, they allow states to test out new ways to operate their Medicaid program. And one of the flexibilities we have approved in Massachusetts is the Flexible Services Program. So the overarching goal of the program at the state level is to address food and housing as health-related social needs, all with the ultimate goal of improving member health outcomes and reducing total cost of care. Our Medicaid agency has encouraged accountable care organizations to partner with high capacity social service organizations to provide um, services to members. We've partnered with seven organizations across Mass Massachusetts um, to co-design nutrition programs. We're currently in the fourth year of a demonstration pilot and are preparing for an exciting transition ahead where this program will transition into the managed care framework starting in 2025. And the last detail I want to call out here about our waiver um, that's particularly relevant to this conversation is the non-duplication requirement. So within flexible services, we are required to assure that the services provided um, do not duplicate other state and federal programs. So it's imperative that the first step is to connect members to SNAP or WIC. And then for our high risk members who continue to experience food insecurity and have complex health needs, we can provide an additional level of services through our nutrition programs. So I'll hand it over to my colleague, Grace Sakor, our Flexible Services Program Manager, to share a bit more about these nutrition interventions. Thank you so much, Anne, for um, teeing that up. Um, can we get to the next slide, please? Thank you. Um, so like Annie mentioned, I'm Grace Sakor, and I'm the Flexible Services Program Manager um, here at C3. So we'll just spend a couple, um, a quick, quick minute here, um, just going through some of the interventions that we um, at C3 have to offer to our members who are experiencing food insecurity. Um, so we've designed a nutrition program for six months um, where we can offer support and services to members, um, like Annie mentioned, who are experiencing food insecurity. Um, members are typically referred um, by their health centers. So when they screen positive for food insecurity, um, we get that referral using our customized website. Um, and then we connect those members to a nutrition coordinator for resource navigation. So this is where it, it really comes down into what we're talking about today and into our topic for today is that during the six months program, once members are enrolled in our nutrition program, we're making sure that those members are connected to programs like SNAP and WIC. It is really critical and important for them to know that they have to be enrolled in SNAP and WIC. We're also, in addition to that, um, assessing our members and also their food security needs um, and connecting, connecting them to direct services that are appropriate for them. Um, we offer nutrition coaching um, and also education sessions to our members. Um, just to support their disease management and as well increase healthy eating and cooking um, lifestyles amongst our members. And then lastly, in addition to that, we're also offering kitchen items and appliances um, just to encourage safe and healthy cooking um, for our members. Um, another really important piece to all of this that we're doing is the nutrition interventions that we've created. Um, we've created some nutrition interventions for members depending on their geographic location in the state of Massachusetts and also their health diagnosis. Um, so we offer some um, interventions for members, um, first being healthy food vouchers and also produce prescriptions. Um, these are reloadable EBT cards um, for purchasing powers that members can use at the grocery store to be able to purchase healthy foods uh, purchase um, fresh produce um, they can, that they can be able to use um, in their homes. In addition to that, another option would be the meal kits. Um, there's a home delivered meal, meal kits that are delivered directly to members' homes and they come with fresh ingredients as well as recipes that members can follow through and have like a fun cooking experience at the comfort of their homes. And then last but not the least is the medically tailored meals um, so we offer medically tailored meals to our members. There's a home delivered meals that are also prepared for members who have diet sensitive conditions. So for example, a member who has diabetes would be an appropriate member that would be referred for a medically tailored meals program because they would be getting meals that are tailored for their health diagnosis. Um, at this point, I'll just pass it over to Annie to conclude this session. Thank you, Grace. So within our flexible services programs, we can go to the next slide. 
we're evaluating both our nutrition and housing interventions, looking at short-term and long-term metrics. Um, we've highlighted some of our process outcomes here. So since launching in 2020, we've implemented workflows at all of our health centers in Massachusetts and have identified over 14,000 eligible members. We're proud that within these workflows and programs, 93% of members that have been referred have connected with one of our social service partners and received services. So these are members with complex medical needs who are referred into our care management programs, referred to one of our nutrition partners for the services that Grace just mentioned and received one of those services. For a snapshot of our program operations, we have 2,200 active members across 20 nutrition and housing programs. And then through these programs, we've invested over $20 million into trusted social service agencies in Massachusetts. So this funding covers those direct services and goods that you heard about that are going directly to the member. And then more importantly, funding that expands the social service capacity in the communities that we serve. Um, in addition to these process metrics, we're tracking social metrics. Um, we're seeing that members are reporting improved food security through our interventions, um, citing improved ability to access food, as well as confidence in preparing healthy foods. Really, you know, thinking about the nutrition education sessions that um, Grace had shared that are foundational to our programs. Um, and in, in this work, our ultimate goal, as I mentioned, is to demonstrate changes in health outcomes and total cost of care. We're working on um, analyses to look at clinical metrics like changes in A1C for members with diabetes, as well as utilization to look for changes um, in ED use and in patient stay. Um, our preliminary analyses show positive trends demonstrating reductions in total cost of care and improvement in health outcomes. Um, and we're continuing to work on um, that evaluation and hope to share our findings later this year. Um, I'll end by um, sharing that we have a digital report, report available that shares more about our lessons learned with this work, um, and we'll share the link for that in the chat. Thank you. Back over to you, Rachel. Thanks, everyone. So with that, we can actually close out the PowerPoint and um, pin, pin our panelists, and we can get chatting. So thank you, everyone, um, really, for sharing all of that terrific information. Um, one of the things that really stands out to me as I was listening to you all speak is really how comprehensive and holistically you're thinking and how you're really trying to address these wraparound services, even around WIC and SNAP access. And so I'm wondering if we can start by honing in a little bit more on the resources that you're leveraging in your different initiatives. And maybe Elizabeth and Ambie, I'll start with you guys. Can you tell us a little bit more about kind of how and why you've really looked to these kind of technology-based outreach capabilities and, and what it's taken to kind of stand up that infrastructure? Sure, maybe I'll start with the how and, and Ambie will talk about the why. Um, so we, Kaiser Permanente has a long history in each of our markets of, of connecting our members to social supports in their market. What we're trying at Kaiser now is to create consistency and in the infrastructure across all of the markets to stand that up and to draw on some of the data that we have while we don't, while we're building data and it's all, it, this will be a huge undertaking on the needs of our members, we are starting with some presumed need um, to, to, to create these outreach campaigns. So the both the SNAP and the WIC outreach are housed under the um, Community Support Hub, the KP Community Support Hub, which launched in the middle of last year, bringing together these number of campaigns um, and to ensure that members across markets will get seamless and customized support. And that seamless and customization means moving through many of the stages that Annie and Grace called out um, that they're working on from screening for social need, recording that social need, referral to community or government services, and then follow up to make sure those needs are met. But it also means trying to build the data infrastructure to know our members better and to create um, communications that some of them will need, for example, 
and, and others want. We've learned some of that during the WIC and the SNAP outreach um, using that presumed eligibility. So maybe I'll then turn to Ambie and, I, I, and ask her about the why. Yeah, thanks, Elizabeth. So in terms of the why, Kaiser Permanente has been supporting the social health needs of our members for a long time um, with the support of a dedicated team of social workers, community health navigators, and others embedded in our care teams. So we really launched the hub to expand our ecosystem of social health support outside and in many cases upstream of care delivery to the many people we know from our research that are struggling with various social health needs, including food and nutrition insecurity. Our 2022 National Social Health Survey found that 25% of our members struggle with food insecurity and are concerned that they will run out of food and not have the resources to buy more. So there's always been, I think from our perspective, a unique role for healthcare to play in facilitating connections to programs that address social health needs. And the hub is really going to allow us to supplement the social health support that is already being provided to our members in some really exciting ways. That's awesome. That's really exciting. And Pamela, I'll drag you back into this. What about, I, I think, you know, even in hearing Ambie and Elizabeth talk there, it was clear that they have kind of a bigger team that's really at play and that, you know, when I listen to you talk about the, the programming at Healthcare Network, you really are clearly relying on a lot of boots on the ground and kind of folks in community. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about kind of the people and the partnerships that you've put in place and how you developed those relationships, how you really support um, the different folks on your team and the likes. Um, I'll first of all say that our, our community health workers receive tra specialized training, and I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not the um, project direct program director, but they receive specialized training from um, a knowledgeable partner, I can't think of the name of the partner, in an become certified as healthcare workers so that they have some background in what they're doing, how how to talk to people and so on. Um, we've had a long-term relationship with other community partners, of course, since we've been here for a long, long time. So we work with all kinds of other agencies from, you know, child care, child care, um, homelessness. We, we're just very well connected with those groups. And then we're also very connected with the um, Coalition of Immokalee Workers, and that's the voice for farm worker um, so that um, we can get word out pretty broadly to that group. And could you, what was the rest of your question? Sorry. No, that's really helpful to hear. I think that that makes a lot of sense. And it, it sounded like, you know, I, I think Elizabeth and Ambie also mentioned how kind of local WIC is. And I feel like you put a lot of work too into kind of developing up your relationships with um, the county or the Department of Health um, and your WIC office there. Right. We also hold community events, like about eight to nine per month events in the community to reach everyone, not just those people who are current patients. So that gets the word out broadly. And we partner with those agencies on events as well. That's awesome. That's great. Thank you. And then Annie and Grace, um, I know you guys talked a little bit about how you're really leveraging the 1115 waiver. And I'm wondering if you can share a little bit more about how in your experience that sort of created more um, opportunity to engage patients on WIC and SNAP and if it's brought kind of new resources to put towards that work. Yeah, absolutely. So I had mentioned the requirements for um, our Medicaid work to screen for health-related social needs, um, as well as the Flexible Services Program. Um, I'd say that screening, universal screening for health-related social needs, really normalizes the conversation around food security within the healthcare space and reduces the stigma around these food safety net programs. 
And then for flexible services, um, that really provides a tangible response for members who have both complex medical needs and they meet the eligibility criteria for intensive services. But for members who are not eligible for flexible services, SNAP becomes a critical part of that conversation. Um, so I actually want to turn it to Grace to share some practical examples from her day-to-day -day work on how these initiatives have bolstered um, our SNAP and WIC efforts. Thank you, Annie. Um, I'll just share some quick um, examples of how um, all this have, um, the work we do on a day-to-day -day basis have bolstered the week of SNAP um, in our program. Um, so we conduct the flexible services training. So once a new community health worker or care navigator is onboarded to the health center, we have to conduct flexible services trainings. And during those trainings, um, the work of SNAP and we cannot be overemphasized because that's a critical component of what we're doing. So we keep saying that over and over to our CHWs during the trainings. Even though you are you are trying to connect those members to flexible services, the big picture here is make sure they are connected to SNAP and WIC. And um and if we look at the food is medicine pyramid that you had shown earlier on in the slide, we can see how um it, it is really at the bottom, which we show like you know the importance of WIC and SNAP in our day to day lives and also in improving the health outcomes of our members. Um another example I would share would be member education. Um, when our nutrition coordinators are communicating with this members during the course of their enrollment in the program, um, member education on SNAP and WIC is very important. We've heard um, from members about some of the barriers they are facing to applying for SNAP. So we've heard the fear of stigma, the fear of public charge, immigration status. They are scared about losing their kids if they say, oh, we don't have enough resources to take care of this kid. So I think a very key component is member education. How are we um, educating our members and building that trust? Like Annie had mentioned earlier on in her slides, like how are we building that trust for our members to know that they can apply for this benefit without the fear of um, immigration status? And then the last thing I would share is off-ramping process. Um, so typically, after the six months that members are engaged in the program, we use the term graduate them um, of the program. So like, you know, we're sending them off. Um, but typically, they are falling back on SNAP in a week after this program has ended. Um, at this point, we really want to be sure that all our members are connected to SNAP in a week at this point when they are leaving the program. So how do we um, educate them more on how to use their dollars? how to use the healthy incentives program, how to maximize their dollars, how to strike the dollars. Um, so I think in all of this, in our day-to-day -day work, all through our six months of the program that members are enrolled at every point in time, at the beginning, in the middle, at the end, before we graduate them, we're making sure that SNAP and WIC is incorporated in what we do. Thank you. I love that. And as I was kind of preparing for today, I was reviewing some of the registrant questions that were coming in. And one person asks sort of how applicable are these experiences that we're lifting up today to other settings, for example, maybe a state that doesn't have an 1115 waiver. And I think what I really appreciate in listening to you all speak and is worth highlighting is that even though we're really only um, looking at three organizations, you're all leveraging different resources, different assets. You're all working within different constraints too. And that I think it means there's so many takeaways for us to bring back to different communities and say, what does this look like here? And so I, I really appreciate that. Um, Annie and Grace, I'll, I'll bring you back for one more second. You've already mentioned kind of some of the barriers or challenges that you've had to navigate in standing up the program. And I'm wondering just if you kind of could take it from a policy perspective. We know that there's such growing kind of regulator interest and momentum in this space from Medicaid agencies, from, you know, WIC agencies, from legislators. Um, so if you could wave a magic wand and have kind of one policy change, I'm going to limit you to one, maybe two, um, what would it be? What would help you do this work better? Yeah, if we had um, a magic wand, we would use it to assure that SNAP is fully funded. 
um, whether that is in the context of um, the looming government shutdown that is currently being in discussion or with the upcoming farm bill. We really need everyone to come together um, to the table, whether it's the healthcare, whether it's healthcare organizations, social service agencies, Medicaid, government agencies. We all need to be talking about the importance of SNAP as the food uh, as a food safety and that to assure that um, the, the, the people that we're serving have access to healthy food and that we aren't waiting until they develop um, a complex health condition like diabetes or heart disease to have Medicaid then pay for food as medicine interventions. Um, and then Rachel, if I can, um, a second piece, and then rather than requiring um, ACOs and MCOs to sign their members up for SNAP, Medicaid agencies have a, value, um, have a valuable magic wand that they could wave to couple the Medicaid and SNAP enrollment application processes. So that's what I would say. And if you know where we can find that magic wand, let us know. Those both really, really resonate. Um, and, and WIC too, right? Fully funding WIC and making sure that that's there as well. Um, I think those shortfalls that we're reading about, that we're hearing about, potential shortfalls are really scary um, and will do a lot of harm. Um, and I, I think on our end, we talk a lot about and think a lot about um, how regulators can really remove or mediate the regulatory barriers that come up in kind of identifying patients, barriers to getting people in in a more streamlined manner. And so all of that really, really rings true here. Um, I'm going to send things back to Elizabeth and Amby for a moment because, you know, we've heard a lot about trust. And I think, Amby, you really, in other conversations, um, made this sort of really compelling point about how, as healthcare organizations, when we're more intensely engaging in this aspect of our patients' lives, it's really important to, you know, not only educate ourselves on WIC and SNAP, but also understand patient experiences with these programs and understand um, stigma and other um, concerns that people might have in experiencing programs, the barriers they might face. I'm wondering if you can share more about how you've gone about the kind of member experience and obtaining insight into member experiences? Absolutely. So, you know, we know that WIC is administered through kind of a, a shared federal, state, and local partnership. So because of that, um, the program is ever evolving due to policy and regulatory changes, um, innovations in technology, economic conditions, and even as we saw during the pandemic, um, public health needs. So while it's critically important to really understand and track development and impacting you know, the broad strokes of the program about eligibility, enrollment, and benefit, and, and Rachel and Topi, you've been great partners in helping us do that, um, it's equally important from our perspective to really learn how patients perceive and experience um, these programs. So we've gone about getting that insight in a couple of different ways. Um, in 2022, my esteemed colleague Kelly conducted a WIC human-centered design project to really learn from our members and frontline care teams how Kaiser Permanente specifically can better support connections to WIC. And that project synthesized feedback from about 40 members and care teams across all of our markets, um, where we learned about really some of the shame that our members have about asking for help and needing to rely on government programs, where we found that there was generally, you know, kind of high awareness of WIC as a program, but that many members were operating on outdated information, um, either based on their prior negative experiences or through word of mouth. And we also heard from our care teams just about that limited time in the care space and really how providers are balancing constantly competing priorities. We've also engaged um, a, one of our third year medical students from the Kaiser Permanente School of Medicine, kind of our, our inside track to really obtain um, perspectives from clinicians on opportunities to support WIC enrollment in care delivery settings. And that information was obtained from um, interviews and observations with providers in pediatric and OBGYN um, care settings, primarily in Southern California. And so again, um, that information that we obtained was just really invaluable to inform our understanding and to kind of confirm or correct some of our assumptions and really to help refine our approach. 
And I would say, um, lastly, we've also tried to obtain member insights from the WIC pilots that we've launched whenever possible. So for example, we reviewed the call agent notes from conversations with members during our WIC outreach calls, which again, was just a tre treasure trove of insights to help kind of course correct and inform our understanding of the work. Thanks, Amy. Pamela, I have one more question for you. Um, and then I'm noticing the time. And so I have one last kind of lightning round of question, uh, question for our panelists. But for folks who are new to kind of the WIC chow opportunity, I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about um, opportunities for technical assistance and what kinds of supports are built into that opportunity, um, whether you expect to share best practices from the grant and how we can tune into that. One of the unique things about the WIC Chow grant is just that we are assigned a mentor team, like a dream team that meets with us once a month at least. Um, we go over um, challenges that we might be facing and then, and they also help their, their um, collecting data for research. So we provide data to them on a quarterly basis about our activities, you know, how, what information we've disseminated so far, all, all kinds of details that go into that. So we have, and it's really lovely that we have that mentor team. That's the, it's really super unique about the WIC Chow. Very appreciative of that. That's so cool. I really look forward to kind of seeing more of what comes out of your grant. I know you guys are still in the really early ages of it. We're, we're past halfway. Oh, you are. Oh, great. Oh, very cool. Well, then I was wrong. I stand corrected. <laughs> so our kind of last question, um, and I encourage folks to just jump in um, if you want to answer it, but what is one suggestion you have for healthcare providers kind of wondering where to start? And I'll flag that I see one question in the chat that's really about for example, how do you start building strong relationships with WIC clinics? So that's where we'll go. Yeah, I can I can jump in on that. Um, I've found that the, the local WIC agencies that I've worked with have just been amazing partners, really eager to partner, great thought partnership on how and, and what we can do to, to really achieve our common goal of connecting members and families to WIC. So if there is interest, my, my advice would be to, to reach out and, you know, have those conversations, identify kind of who in your, in your footprint is, is active in the WIC space and really initiate that engagement. I'll add to that. Um, we're here to help them. We're, if they have difficulties, we'll make that phone call to remind a, a woman of her WIC appointment. We'll drive her to that appointment. We'll do whatever it takes to make sure that that goes smoothly. Um, we would help with anything that they need as far as that goes. Um, so we're here to help them. We don't want to put extra burden on them because ours, like many, are also understaffed. And I'll add and say, um, just start. The food insecurity needs in communities are striking, and there's no initiative that's too big or too small. So similar to what um, Ambie had said, find an organize, find the organizations in your community that are working to address food needs and have a conversation with them and really understand what services are currently being provided, what are the gaps from their perspective, and then how you can partner to advance the work. And then maybe I'd add one of the key components is reporting back afterwards. Um, and it's it may be really simple, but um, the, what you learn from, from some of these initiatives is actually really helpful to partners um, as well. And so that report back is helpful. I think lastly, I'll just echo what everyone said, but like one very important thing is just that, like Annie had said, just that, and also make sure that the, the needs are uh, really being met when you do that. And with that, we are at the end of the hour. So thank you again to all of our panelists and to all of you for joining. I'm sorry we weren't able to get to more of the questions, but I will be sure to review them and see if there are other opportunities for us to send along some answers. Thanks so much, and we'll see you soon.